Part 1 Part 1 You will hear a conversation between an event director and a student at a conference for studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi there, how are you? I am glad that you came to the convention today. We have a lot of schools here today talking about study abroad programs. You can talk to them and find out which program works best for you. We also have a presentation called How to Prepare for University Studies. I recommend that you attend. The presentation starts at 9am and it will help you understand what you need to do before you go to university. It will take place in the Blue Room. Oh, the Blue Room? Where is that? Ah, let me explain the schedule first. Then I'll tell you about where the events are. OK, thanks. Yes, so the conference organiser will talk about 30 minutes telling you how to prepare for university-level courses. They can be very tough for new students. He will also talk about the special needs of international students. They have a different set of issues to deal with than students from the home country. So you said that was in the Blue Room? Yes, that's right. And after that, you can go into the conference room at 10 o'clock. What is happening there? That's where the booths are. Booths? What kind of booths? One for each school grouped into sections. People from each individual school will be able to give you information about different kinds of programs abroad. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, so how do I get around the conference room? Right. Let me tell you about how to get there first. So when you exit the blue room, you have to turn left. Walk until you get to the end of the hallway and you'll see two doors on both sides of you. The conference room is on your right. The room on the left side is the banquet hall, but there aren't any events scheduled there for today. Oh, OK. The banquet hall is where the washrooms are. Yes, the washrooms are at the very back on the side opposite the doors. All right then, so how many schools will be represented? We have over 50 schools here today. Oh wow, that's a lot. That's OK. I'll give you a brief layout. The booths are laid out by region. That means schools from the same country will be in the same section. The first section you see when you enter the conference room are the schools from Australia. I see. That is quite a popular destination these days. What other sections are there? If you walk further on, the next section will have schools from Europe. Most of them are from England, but there are other countries as well. Oh, yes. Are there any places where I can get refreshments? Of course. Talking can work up an appetite. Refreshments are available all the way in the back of the conference room, past the Australian and European sections. Thanks for all the help. No problem. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two.
You will hear a presenter on a radio show. The presenter is talking to the manager of a local library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. And welcome back to the programme. Today, I'm talking with Mary Littlejohn from Mere Green Library. As you'll all know, we've sadly been without our local library for the past three months. But the good news is that it's about to open again. Great news, Mary. It certainly is, Jonathan. Despite the fact that money's in short supply, I think visitors will be pleasantly surprised at how different and hopefully better everything is. Fortunately, we didn't need to replace the roof as we'd originally feared. It just needed repairing, so we were left with more money than we expected. We've been able to replace all that old wooden shelving with a more modern style. The computers have been moved to a new designated IT room and on the subject of technology, visitors can now order and return books and CDs on their own with our new automated system, so no more queuing to be served. Sadly, money ran out before we had the chance to decorate the meeting room, but we're hoping to complete that next year. Oh, and the children's section now has some colourful new tables and chairs as well. That all sounds fantastic. So are you having a big reopening party? Well, the doors open on the 28th of August and we'll be serving tea, coffee and sandwiches at 12.30. Then we get down to business in September. The local history society will be meeting on the first Monday of each month at 7.30 as usual and we'll be starting our Wednesday lunchtime book club at one o'clock. Both of those events are in the meeting room. The computer club won't be running in September as we still need to complete work in the IT suite, but this will certainly be returning in October. And we're especially looking forward to welcoming a local writer, Sally Wainwright, to a new event on the 22nd of September. This will be the first of a series of events we're calling Ask the Author. Visitors will be able to hear authors read from their latest works, ask questions and even buy a copy of their book to take home. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I might pop along to that one myself. Now, I understand you also have a request. Yes, that's right. We're looking for anyone who has a few spare hours each week who would like to offer their services to the library. Our computer classes have become so popular over the past year that we're thinking about starting a second session and we'll need someone to run it. The current teacher will work with you so you won't be left to sort things out on your own. We can promise the person a warm welcome and a class of very motivated people, many of whom are at quite a high level. We're also trying to do our bit to break down the generation gap and we've been inviting some of our older citizens in to talk to school groups about the past. The children range in age from 7 to 11. They're always accompanied by their teacher, by the way, but we haven't opened it up to teenagers yet. So if you'd like to help out, please get in touch. 
And I also understand you've got good news for those who've been making use of the mobile library. Yes, because the library has been closed, we've been running a mobile library service and going out to people in the community. Well, feedback has been so positive about this, particularly amongst our elderly users, that we've decided to keep it going. Users can reserve books if the bus doesn't have anything that they feel like borrowing. There's a computer on board with access to the library database, so the librarian will be able to reserve one for you. Unfortunately, we don't stock newspapers or magazines on the bus, as these tend to be for reference purposes only and can't be taken away. We're also pleased to be working with the local council, who've agreed to send someone from the community office on the bus. They'll be able to help you with any local issues you may have. Well, many thanks, Mary. I'm sure our listeners will be delighted to hear the service is fully up and running again. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation between two student teachers talking about our projects. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hey, Janice. Hey, Jimmy. What's up? Not much. I'm kind of worried about these lessons we have to plan. I've not worked much with children before. Oh, you don't have anything to worry about, Jimmy. All we have to do is choose a few art projects to do with the kids. Then we have to get the materials for them and do the projects by the end of the month. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad then. Maybe we could get some ideas from online websites. Yep, already did that. I printed out descriptions of the best five, and I wanted to ask you what you thought. Great. Yeah, let's look over them. Here you go. Some are from a teaching website, and some are from an arts and crafts website. We can talk about what kind of materials we'll need and what would be best for our students. Hmm. The first art project here is called Make Your Own Mask. That sounds like fun. For materials, all we need are scissors, markers, stiff paper, and pieces of string. We have all those at the school already. What's the procedure again? You give everyone the stiff paper. There are some basic guidelines the kids have to follow, like where to cut out holes for the eyes, and then one hole for the nose. The kids then colour in the mask any way they want, or we can ask them to create masks with a theme, like animals or something. That seems easy to do. Okay, now the second project here. Yes. This one is called shoebox dioramas. Each student gets a shoebox. And puts one long side of the shoebox into the lid. It now looks sort of like a covered theatre stage. The students then have to create a scene inside the shoebox with the materials we give them, including styrofoam and basically anything else we can think of. We can tell them to do a historical scene, or just somewhere they have been before. All right. Well, what's the next one? For art project number three, we need egg cartons and pipe cleaners. What's a pipe cleaner? Pipe cleaners are basically flexible lengths of metal wire that are furry. They come in all sorts of different colours. They're very useful in crafts. For this project, you take the individual egg holder cups and stick the pipe cleaners in them to make animals. Okay, that sounds interesting. The fourth art project is called paper bag animal. Students can use brown or white paper bags. They decorate these bags with markers or pieces of coloured felt. They decorate the bottom of the bag. When the children put their hands in the bag and hold the bag upright, 
it becomes a sort of puppet. We'd need quite a few paper bags. Yes, we'd need the small lunch bag kind. The grocery paper bags would simply be too large. Okay, I suppose they would have them available at the corner store. Yes, it's not very green to pack lunches in them, but they're still popular to use. So, what do you think of the last project? Well, this fifth project sounds fun. It's called paper mache sculptures. We tear some newspapers into strips and dip them into liquid starch. The kids can choose any object to cover with the strips, like a blown-up balloon. After letting them dry, the kids can decorate the paper mache with paint. Sounds a little messy. Shall we go over them and see what's good and bad about each? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. So yeah, number one sounds really easy to do, and you mentioned that we already have all the materials, right? Yes, but I think I wanted to do something a bit more hands-on and creative. I mean, I suppose they can wear their masks and play around, but the project is just basically drawing on paper. It might be too easy. I suppose so. What do you think about number two? Well, it certainly is more creative, but do you think that is too hard? I mean, they would have to create whole scenes out of a lot of different kinds of materials. Well, I think that the kids could do it. We would have to give them a little more guidance, but you're right; it might be too difficult for them. How about number three? I did this one as a child. Yes, I tried to make egg carton creatures as well. It was quite fun, as I recall. Do you think we could get the supplies? I suppose, though. Unfortunately, the craft store in town is closed. It might be hard. I see. Well then, we'd have to find another way to get them if we do this project. Okay. Well, what do you think of the fourth art project? Well, when I first looked at it, I thought it might be good, but you know what? Yes. What is it? Actually, I think our students may have already done this art project in another section. Oh, really? You think they have? Yes, I'm pretty sure now. Actually, I don't think it'd be good to repeat it. I suppose so. How about the last project? I really like the concept, but it seems really, really messy. I mean, we have to dip the newspaper strips by hand into the starch, then wrap it around something, and finally paint the object after it dries. It sounds really fun, but there will definitely be a lot of cleanup. Well, that's too bad then. Hmm. I guess I can go online and do some more research. You know, I'll help with that too. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm sure we'll find something. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a psychological condition called synesthesia. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to look at a fascinating condition that challenges the idea that we all see and experience the world around us in a similar way. For example, what do you see when I mention a day of the week or a month? What colour is the letter A or the number 10? If you often find yourself having more than the normal sense sensations, you too could have a condition known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a harmless but fascinating condition which is often described by psychologists as the joining of the senses. We normally experience our senses individually, so we see a colour or hear a word, whereas people with synesthesia will find two or more senses being stimulated at the same time by a single stimulus. Some people will see or feel a colour when they hear a sound. Others will experience a taste or smell when another sense is stimulated. This happens automatically. The sensation can't be managed. People often go through life unaware that they have the condition. A common response from individuals who learn for the first time that they have synesthesia is one of surprise to discover that other people don't experience the same thing. It's a normal part of life for them, and they will rarely describe the symptoms negatively. To estimate the numbers of people with synesthesia, one group of researchers sat people in front of a computer and showed them letters and numbers in black. Participants were asked to choose a colour for each character they saw. A small proportion of participants, namely those with synesthesia, consistently described the same characters as having the same colours. On the basis of the results, researchers were able to predict that synesthesia affects about 1% of the population. This number has been confirmed in other research. Synesthesia takes many different forms, but the most common is to see or feel a colour in relation to letters and numbers. It's commonplace for people to identify A with red, B with blue and so on. Some people will actually see a colour, but in most cases it's a question of feeling or sensing the colour. However, it's just as commonplace to see days, months, letters and numbers spatially, that is in lines or circles for example. People might say they see Monday up high, Tuesday just below Monday, Wednesday on the left, Thursday on the right and so on. This doesn't mean that people with synesthesia always agree on what they sense. Two synesthetes will often argue over the colour of a letter, for example. But patterns emerge if a large enough sample of people are observed, providing clear evidence of this condition despite individual variations. Colour and spatial synesthesia are amongst the most common forms of the condition, but they are by no means the only way people experience it. One of the more interesting combinations is word-taste synesthesia. This occurs when words lead the person to experience tastes or certain taste sensations, so a person's name might have the flavour of a particular sweet. Places might be associated with the taste of particular snacks. Taste needs to be seen in a wider context here. The sensation may be a feeling on the tip of the tongue or at the back of the throat, and will differ from person to person. Some researchers believe we are all born with the condition, and that it's most prevalent in our early years, but it then tends to become less noticeable as we enter childhood. It's a fascinating thought that, as infants, we experience the world around us through our senses in a different way than as adults. However, testing this hypothesis will be challenging, bearing in mind the difficulty of getting feedback from young infants. Research also points to the fact that synesthesia runs in families. In fact, as many as 40% of synesthetes, as they are called, know of someone in the family with a similar condition. This won't necessarily be a close family member, and the condition may be traceable back to previous generations, or to an extended family member such as a cousin or uncle. There is evidence that synesthetes are often creative and will often have 
artistic hobbies or interests. Researchers think this is not necessarily because synesthesia makes them naturally more talented in this area, but the fact that they have multiple sensory experiences generates an interest in, for example, art or music. So, that's synesthesia. Apart from its intrinsic interest, for psychologists it's a fascinating indication that we may all experience the world around us in different ways. Once upon a time, these findings would have been regarded as highly subjective, lacking evidence and not of any scientific worth. However, we now have a much greater interest in how the brain helps us make sense of the world, and the study of synesthesia is one way for us to discover more about this. That is the end of part four. Thank you.